so when it comes to, to actors and actresses, you can, you can tell your unit, you can say to your, uh, your cameraman, that's what you're going to do. And <laughs> if you don't want to do it, I'll get another operator in to do it. But you see, actors, the further you get into the picture, the more they've got you by the shorts. Because you cannot afford to fire them. Once you've done three weeks' work on them, they're in this very, very powerful position. Because you cannot get rid of them, even if you want to. But you can get rid of a director. And uh, uh, because he's not up on the screen. So in the last analysis, if, a, if a, a, an important actor fights with a director, to the point where the not only is the producer brought in, but the finances are brought in, and the president of the company is brought in, they're going to have a little conference, and they're going to say, well, uh, we're just going to have to change the director. And uh, lots of directors have been taken off pictures because of that. Now, I was very, very nearly taken off uh, the Judy Garland picture, the last picture that I made with Judy. Um, because Judy was famous for firing directors. I mean, there was hardly a picture that she went through without want having them fired or wanting them fired. And uh, I remained only because United Artists, who, who were, were very fond of me at that time, Arthur Klim and Co., because I made uh, several pictures for them, and uh, they knew that I had integrity and they knew that I was, I was reasonably efficient. And they stood right by me. And they uh, took the attitude that if um, Miss Garland wouldn't cooperate, that they would shut the picture down and they would sue her. This was the last film that she made. It was, uh, it was a, a picture called I Could Go On Singing or The Lonely Stage. It had two titles. It had a lot of songs in it. Uh, and that perhaps brings us very naturally to, to a point of, of discussing somebody like Judy, because uh, sooner or later you're going to come up against all these kind, this, this kind of thing, and you're going to have to know how to deal with it. Judy had a reputation, as I'm sure you all know, of being very, very difficult, of, of not showing up, uh, of saying she didn't feel like working today. And, uh, Indeed, it, it, it very nearly ruined her career. But she wasn't in, it wasn't, in fact, a, a, a vicious thing. It was a, uh, sh she would get into a state, into a, 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 a fear, uh, into fear that was so strong and so powerful that, that she, she couldn't go on. And I thought, in my innocence, in my ignorance, when I accepted to direct Judy in this picture, I thought, I'll be able to handle her all right. I've heard terrible stories about her. I've heard terrible stories about Dustin Hoffman, by the way. I've never worked with him. I'm told he's utterly impossible to work with. But there's a part of me that thinks, I'd rather like to work with him. Perhaps I could cope. Perhaps I could manage. <laughs> sort of kind of conceit, you know. And um, um, I met Judy, and Judy was, was charming. and, and uh, uh, I liked her very much, and we, we became quite friendly and before we, we started the picture, and I thought this is all going to be really enjoyable, it's going to be all right. And then her agent came over to see her two or three days before we started filming, and that was David Beagleman, who I expect you may remember, all of you. And uh, David came over and had sessions with Judy and asked how everything was going and he was very charming and he was very friendly and it all seemed splendid. And then he said he was going back to Hollywood and Judy said, you're not to go, David. And I thought, well, God damn it, she's right, you know. She needs her agent. She pays him 10%. She pays him a lot of money. He ought to find some way of staying with her. And she got more and more worked up about this and David became more and more quiet friendly, but more, and, but more and more determined that this is what he had to do. And I looked at David and I said, you know, David, I think she's absolutely right. I think you should stay. I think you should find a way of staying. And he looked back at me, and it was a perfect piece of, of, act, of not acting, because
because he was really he was really being it but it's what a really good actor should be he looked at me and on his face came an expression oh you poor thing you don't know what you're in for you think that this is a very reasonable woman but uh, you just wait and see and all that came on his face <laughs> without him saying a word well of course I he was absolutely right um, she could be marvelous wonderful warm beautiful actress keen knowing her lines backwards, everything right about her. And then suddenly, for no reason at all, for no apparent reason, she would change like that and she would become an utterly different person, an utterly different personality, and utterly impossible. And uh, we had these various moods on and off through the picture. And uh, I think have I talked to you about Judy at all? Not at all. I do, oh, I see. Because I have talked about her before, and uh, when, when you have talked about Judy, you suddenly think, well, maybe I mentioned this on the first day or whatever. But um, <coughs> she used to call me Pussycat when everything was going well. It was, you know, good morning, Pussycat. When things were going badly, it was, get that goddamn British Henry Hathaway off the set. Now, I don't suppose ma many of you know Henry Hathaway, but Henry Hathaway is a Hollywood director and has a reputation for being a bully. And uh, so when she said, get that goddamn British Henry Hathaway off the set, that was when she really hated me. And it was some days she hated me and some days she loved me and I l I learned how to cope with it quite well I mean uh, for example we'd finish shooting let's say at six o'clock in the evening and being me I would uh, and, and being British studios uh, when you'd want to go and discuss the next day's work with your with your assistant director or your production manager or your cameraman you go straight to the bar there's always a bar in the studio you have a nice drink and you all sit around a table and you can do another half hour, three quarters of an hour or even an hour's work discussing the next day whilst relaxing and enjoying a drink. I think it's very uncivilized that film studios over here do not have bars. I suspect it's because you Americans all get drunk, whereas of course we British remain terribly sober. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one evening I was in the bar and the phone rang and it was Judy and Judy had not been feeling that well that day and uh, had decided to stay at Shepparton in a little hotel instead of going back to London and it was a little hotel and the bedrooms were very very little they were just little square boxes with a wardrobe and a bed and a dressing table but anyway Judy had elected to stay there so she phones me and she knew I'd be in the bar having a drink after shooting Ronnie, I've got to see you, I've got to talk to you, I've got to talk to you immediately. Oh, oh, what do you mean like tonight, Judy? Yes, like tonight, I need you right now, this minute. So I said, okay, get, give me 15 minutes, I'll come over. So I now phone, phone, phone my wife and say, I, um, sorry, I've, I've got to go um, and sit with Judy. This happened all the way through the film. And uh, uh, my wife uh, of that time uh, said, you know, I don't understand you, Ronnie. This woman just twists you around her little finger. She's, she, 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 you're always at her beck and call. She's rude to you. And, and yet you still love her and you still care about her. And, you know, you, <laughs> she said, I don't understand it. I said, well, if, if you knew Judy like I know Judy, you, you would understand. And incidentally, the whole unit loved this woman. We all loved her. Even though she drove us around the bend, we still cared about her. She had a quality that made you want to protect her, even though she'd then lash out and bash you across the nose, m metaphorically speaking. So on this night, I went to the hotel, and there was Judy in, in bed, with three bottles of Blue Nun's wine lined up. She was only allowed to drink Blue Nun's um, white wine. I can't think why. She'd had hepatitis, and it was the one drink, apparently, 
that uh, it was all right for her. And she used to get through three bottles a day, uh, usually, or thereabouts. And there she was, and she was in bed, and she had a glass of wine. And she said, sit down, Ronnie, and let's, let's talk. She said, I'm feeling very ill, and very ill, and I do need somebody to talk to. And she said, oh, by the way, I've got a doctor coming in in, in uh, 30 minutes. He's going to give me some medication that I want, and so on and so forth. So we chatted, and uh, they, I had a scotch from downstairs. And uh, sooner, uh, in a little while, the doctor arrived. So uh, the doctor comes in, so I say, well, OK, Judy, I'm, I'll, I'll be downstairs. When the doctor goes, I'll come up again, and we'll chat a little more. So I left. About 15 minutes later, the doctor comes storming out of the bedroom, comes up to me and said, Miss Garland is completely impossible. I cannot uh, treat her. I cannot be of any help to her whatsoever. Uh, and so good night. So he went. So I went back in, and there she was sitting there. And I said, what, what's the matter, Judy? What have you done? Oh, she says, he's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I know exactly what I need, she says. I know what I need. And I told him what I needed. And he said, I'm the doctor, and I will tell you what you need. And this started a row, and, and, and the doctor walked. So now Judy says, I want another doctor. Now, by now, we're around about 10 in the evening, you know. Well, I go, how can I get another doctor now, Judy? And what's more, how can I get a doctor that is going to do what you tell him to do? I said, I'll go downstairs and find out. So I went to the manager of the hotel, and I said, Miss Garland does need a doctor, but she does need a doctor who will understand what her needs are, whatever they are. <laughs> and is there anybody else around who, who in this town who you think might do? He said, well, there is another doctor. He does happen to be a friend of mine. I'll telephone him and see if he'll come along. So in due course, this other doctor comes along. And uh, before he goes in, uh, when, when the, the doctor's here, business comes from the telephone downstairs. I said, Judy, OK, let me go and talk to the doctor. So I went out, and I said, good evening, doctor. Very nice of you to come out at this hour of the evening, and so on. I'm very grateful. Now, Miss Garland is a, a lady who, who uh, feels that she knows all about herself and she knows what she needs she knows what kind of medication she needs and I said I think if you wouldn't mind the best thing to do is to play along with her unless she asks you for coke or something that you can't give her uh, I think you should you should play along with her if you can because that then I will might get a day's work out of her tomorrow but if, if you go in and you upset her I, I'm not going to get her on the set tomorrow morning so the doctor goes in and he was very tactful and very sensible. And 20 minutes later, he came out. He said, it's all perfectly all right. She's very happy. I've given her what she needs. And I think she was fine. And so on. Now I go in, and Judy's all smiles. And um, uh, I say, well, Judy, darling, I think I'll go now. And I, I give her a nice hug, and I, and I kiss her. And, and I said, are you going to sleep all right? You're going to be fine. And she said, yes, pussycat, I'm going to be fine. Why? Off I go to bed, go home to bed. By now, it's well after midnight. Now, the next day, she was as good as gold. She was laughing. She was joking with everybody. And she was very fond of Dirk Bogart, who played the lead. And we had a lovely day. And that evening, at around about 6 o'clock, I hope this is not boring you all, by the way, because it's nothing to do with, with, uh, with the technique of filmmaking, but it does have a lot to do with, with uh, the other part of a director's job, <coughs> you know, the, the mother part as opposed to the father part. And um, so we had this lovely day, and in the evening it was all working so well that I suggested to Judy that we should rehearse the song that she was going to do uh, on a big extra call at the Palladium in a, in, in a week's time. And uh, I thought it would be a good idea to rehearse this song just a little bit this evening with the, the composer and the pianist. Uh, not the composer, because it was a song she'd sung before, but with the arranger, um, Paul uh, Saul Chaplin, who's a very famous musical arranger. And we rehearsed the sequence. And after we uh, rehearsed it, Judy came up to me, put her arms around me, and said, we're all right, pussycat. And I said, we're all right, Judy, darling. I'm going home to bed early. Good night. And I went. I went home. I said, 
to, to my wife. I said, um, it's marvelous. We really, it's all our problems are over. Uh, we really completely understand each other now. And she said, nice, she's been nice, and she's been good, and she's been warm, and uh, uh, hooray. So I went to bed. Now, three o'clock in the morning, phone rings. I pick up the phone. Ronnie? I said, uh, yes? Judy. Oh, oh, hello, Judy. I, how are you? Um, uh, uh, yes, what is it? I can't come in today. Why can't you come in, Judy? Because I have something more important to do. You can shoot around me. I, I said, Judy, darling, I, I, I can't shoot around you. I've, I've been shooting around you all the way through this film. I've shot everything there is to shoot if you're not in. <laughs> you know, I've just got to have you. There's no, nothing else to do. She says, Liza is more important to me than your effing film. I said, of course Liza's more important to you. What, what, what's that got to do with it? Liza is going to Israel tomorrow, and I am going to take her to the airport, and I am going to see her off, and that's it, and you're not going to stop me. I said, oh, Judy, surely, you know, you can say goodbye to Liza if, if at home. Do you have to go to the airport? I have to go to the airport. I said, well, what time is the plane? 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. I said, okay. I said, get your makeup on at home. Get your hair done at home, which he often did anyway. I said, take Liza to the airport and come straight onto the studio. Now, fortunately, the studio was only 20 minutes away from the airport and was on the way from London. From London, you go to Shepparton's and then the airport is just 15 minutes away. She said, I may never come in again. And down goes the receiver. So you think, oh, God, well, what am I going to do? So you go in the next morning. There's the unit already, set, having set up the shots of the first shots of the day, which, of course, includes Judy. And uh, you say, oh, I'm sorry, Judy isn't coming in this morning, not till midday. What could we do? Well, we think, I think we had two or three inserts that we could do. But that was all we could do. I mean, we were grounded. So around about 12 o'clock, which is an hour after the plane is supposed to have left, I get the assistant, to, assistant director to phone Judy at home and see what's happened. So, and, and I sent not, not anybody else, but I sent the assistant director, Colin Brewer, who was extremely good with Judy and who cared for Judy as much as I cared for Judy. So he went and telephoned. There was a, the secretary, who she was ha had at that time, said, Miss Garland is sleeping, and she is not to be disturbed until 2 o'clock. He comes back and tells me that. I say, look, you go back and you phone that secretary and say she is to go and wake Miss Garland, and Miss Garland has got to be here immediately, which he did. And he said it sufficiently authoritatively, so uh, Miss Garland was wakened up. So lunchtime comes, no Judy. Two o'clock comes, no Judy. Two thirty comes, no Judy. Three o'clock, she walks in to the set with curlers on. She comes up and she says, you shit, you could have given me the whole day off. I said, Judy, I couldn't give you the whole day off, darling. How can I make you understand? She says, well, I think you could. I think you could have given me the day off. What do I have to do? So I said, well, we've got this lined up and all ready, and I'll just talk uh, to you about it, and then you can go and get your hair fi finished and get the last minute touches, and we'll do it. And it was a very difficult scene. It was a scene where she goes and stands in front of a mirror, and a, 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 a sales lady from a shop has brought about six hats and she has to try on each hat and decide which hat suits her best, looking in the mirror. And then there's dialogue. Um, the, the, the hat business was to take the weight off the lines. That was the business. And the, the dialogue, of course, was the dialogue of the scene. All right, about um, a quarter to four, she comes onto the set. She says, well, let's do it. So we rehearsed it two or three times, and we, we shot it. And it was very good. 
And I said, that's fine, Judy. Let's just do one more. Nothing to say, but just let's do one more. Now, to go back to something I touched on earlier, if you've got a scene that you're going to cut close shots in, then you should have two takes, maybe even three takes, of your main shot. Because then you get the opportunity of it intercutting your close shot with your main shot, picking the best part of whatever take you want of the main shot. In other words, you can use all three takes and use the best of each take. But also, very often, you have nothing to say because what they did was very good. So you want to leave well alone. That's one of the occasions when you leave well alone. And you just say, what, just, just one more. Now, also, in the case of Judy, when she got a take, got it right, and it was good, she was better the next take. And then you take it a third time, and she's even better. She was a, uh, an actress who got better and better as you did more takes. So clearly, if I would said, print take one, let's move on, she would have said to me, oh, wait a minute, I, I want another take. Because she knew as well as I did that she could, might do it better. So she knew that when I said, that's very good, darling, just let's do it once more. But she was very angry with me. So she said, you said that was good. And I said, yes, it was very good, Judy. Well, if it was good, why do I have to do it again? I said, Judy, it was very good. But can we just do one more without getting into a discussion? So I said, just let's do it, just, just one more quickly. I am not going to do another take until you tell me what was wrong with that one and why I have to do another take. I said, Judy, you know very well why I want to do another take. I want to do another take because very often, without me saying a word, you, you get better. Well, she said, you said I was good. Y yes, you were good. Well, then, I said, but you could be better. And it became an argument which she deliberately stirred up. She wanted the argument. So there came a point when I knew there was no point in doing it again, because th the whole feeling had gone. So I said, OK, Judy, you win. Give me the viewfinder, I said to the, to the uh, operator. We'll move on to the close shot. Oh, no, we won't, said Judy. We'll do it again. <laughs> I said, Judy, we are not going to shoot that shot again, we will do the close shot. She said, then you will do the close shot without me. And she walked. And she walked off the set, and she turned back just before she disappeared behind the flat. And she said, and what is more, I'm not coming back until I'm treated like a lady. I went to her trailer and knocked at the door and the voice said, who is it? And I said, it's Ronnie. It was dead silent. I don't want to talk to you. I said, Judy, please, let me talk to you. Let me come in and talk to you. So um, she opened the door very reluctantly. She was by herself. And she was taking her makeup off and all of that. And I went across to her, and I knelt down beside her. And I said, Judy, darling, please let's stop fighting. We both of us want a good picture. You're, you're, you're such a lovely actress. And you know, I'm not a bad director. And we, we really must try and work together. And we must try and avoid these scenes. And I thought, well, surely she'll soften now. Surely she'll relent. But she wasn't going to relent. She said, I am not coming back until I feel like coming back. And it may be never, you know. So I couldn't get do any more. I couldn't grovel on the floor. I'd already gone on my knees. <laughs> <laughs> so I left. Now, many several days later, she said rather proudly to everybody, I had him on his knees begging to me. You know, I mean, she used it. It was very naughty. Anyway, this was, I think it was a Wednesday, or may have been a Tuesday, I think. So, of course, Wednesday, no Judy. Now the cables are starting to go backwards and forwards between Hollywood and London, and the telephone calls are starting to happen. Comes Thursday, and 
one of the top executives from New York got on the phone to me and said, look, Ronnie, this is, can't go on. Uh, uh, Judy wants another director brought in immediately. Um, what do you feel about it? And I said, well, you know, I, uh, obviously you, you can't fire Judy. So, I, I mean, if you have to, you have to fire me. But I think we shouldn't let her get away with it. I think we should be strong. I said, it's very tough for me. Believe you me, it's very tough to, to go on directing when I know that the actress is, is, uh, really wants me removed. But I said, I, think, I don't think you should give way to her. And so they said, well, look, if you are prepared to take it, we'll take it. Could you finish the film without her? <laughs> the first question. <laughs> so you think a minute, you think, well, I suppose if we made Dirk Bogard narrate the whole story, <laughs> then <laughs> he, could, he could narrate the scenes that we hadn't shot. <laughs> but then I remembered that we had this enormous hall at the London Palladium where we'd booked this theatre for the day and where we'd already put out a call for 1,200 extras uh, to fill this theatre, or uh, not to fill it, but to fill it so it looked full. And uh, also, there was no film, there was no story at all without this last uh, big scene with her last big song, which, strangely enough, was a song, was a, a sequence straight out of Judy's own life because the sequence was a packed London Palladium who had come to watch, to listen to this actress singing on the stage. And the actress was an hour late and the audience are beginning to slow clap and they can't find her anywhere. And the, the whole sequence revolves around a no show, which happens with Judy all the time in real life at these concerts that she did. And this was absolutely essential for the end of the film. So I said, well, I have to have the London Palladium sequence. After the London Palladium sequence, well, yes, maybe it would be all right. So they said, OK, we'll, we'll deal with that. Be ready to shoot on Monday. And we'll let the rest of the week go. Fine. That's when they cabled Judy and said, if you do not appear on Monday at 8.30 in the morning, we will shut the picture down and we will sue. Okay, Monday morning comes along. Here we have 1,200 extras filling the theater. It's 8.30. We're all ready for Judy. No Judy, of course no Judy. 9.30, no Judy. 10.30, no Judy. So I think, all right, I know what I do. I'll, I know the movement of the, uh, of the song. I know exactly where she's going to go. And indeed, I'd already heard, rehearsed with the camera the various movements with me playing Judy, so that, they, so that at least when she did arrive, we'd be very ready to shoot. Um, however, I'd now done all that, so there was nothing else I could do. And then I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll put on the playback, and I'll sing to the playback, and I'll make all the movements, and I will play Judy to the reactions from the audience. Because I wanted a lot of reaction shots, because when Judy does sing, they mean they're not quite like they are when the, the Beatles sing or the, Ro the, the Rolling Stones sing. But nevertheless, they do in their, in their own way. They, they used to get very excited with Judy, and they used to cheer and, and stand up and move towards the stage and all of that. So there's me looking absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> singing to a playback to all these people and getting them to, yeah. Now, by about quarter to 12, I suppose, this is done. Then again, we sit down. About quarter past 12, the makeup man, her makeup man, arrives on the set and says, Ronnie, she's in. Oh, I said, thank God. By the way, we had to get out of the theater at 5.30 because they had a show that evening at 6.30. So I'd only got to 5.30. So I said, oh, good, fine. Tell her get made up and come on the set and I'll run through the song with her. So he went back. Later I, I learned that she said to him, does Ronnie think he's going to do the choreography of this song? <coughs> Has he got it all worked out? Oh, good for him. You know, rather like that. Eventually she comes on the set about, we broke, I broke very early for lunch then. When I knew she was there, I made a half hour break for lunch. So. 
Um, by the time she'd got her makeup and everything, we'd had lunch and we were back, and it was now sort of, I don't know, about one o'clock. So she comes on the set with her curlers still in and all of that, and a dressing gown. And she says, well, what do I do? I said, well, Julia, I thought what might be a good idea is if you begin here, and if you move to that side of the stage for the first verse, back to center stage, over here, I said, we're going back, we've got a train, we're going back. Come out on the apron, because we'd built an apron out from the stage so that you could come right out into the audience. Come out onto the front of the apron, do your business there, come back, and that's where you look into the wings and you see Dirk Bogart is watching you. Because in the film, she says, well, you come back to the theater with me ha and stay with me. And he says, I'll stay with you until you're on your feet again. And he's not, he, he's, they, they're parting they do part. And he says, I'll stay with you until I know you're all right. So he comes and he stands in the wings. And all the time she's doing this number, she keeps looking for him. And there he is standing and he's watching her. And just towards the end of the song, when she's got herself really worked up into a typical Judy thing, she looks into the wings and he's gone. But she finishes the, the song. And that, in fact, is the end of the picture. And so I explained all these movements to her. And she looked at me and she said, that's all right, Pussycat. That's very good, Pussycat. Let's go. She went in. She did that song. She did the, 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 all the big, typical Judy stuff, including the bit in front of it where she comes on and everybody says, somebody says, where you been, Judy? And she says, uh, uh, a sprained ankle, which she did, you know? And she says, you like my coat? And it's a mink. And uh, they say, yes, we love it. She throws it on the floor and she treads on it, you know. She says, that's what I do with my old mink. And it's lines like that, all of which she did beautifully. In this case, I did have two or three cameras. We got the whole sequence by about quarter to five. We were out of the theater by 5.30. And she came up to me at the end and she said, we're all right, Chris. Now, by that time, I'm a, I've, I was a wet rag, you know. <laughs> However, there was only about four or five more days for the picture shooting now, six days, which went quite smoothly. There were no more, no more real problems out, out of that. Then we came to the looping. She had to do some looping. And she was very efficient at looping, very good at looping. We got the looping done, and then we found there was one more close shot that we had to get of her that, we, that I'd been meaning to take for a long time. It was on the lawn at Shepperton outside the building. And so we went out, and the, um, this close shot was the last shot. So there's the whole unit there. We're all there. And we're on this shot of Judy, and I think we get to take three. And I say, OK, cut. That's it, Judy, darling. It's finished. It's really finished. And she looked at me, and then she looked at all the rest of the and she said, you'll miss me when I'm gone. And she walked, and that was it. We didn't see her again. But, and you know, even as I say it, it all, almost makes me cry. We missed her. We missed her so much. Because she was such a wonderful person. And of course, she never made another picture. And finally, what she'd been playing at for several years, which was, a, which was attempting suicide, always leaving the door open for somebody to, somebody to rescue her. This time, she didn't leave the door open wide enough, and indeed she died.